It's time to sit back, relax, and listen to Conversations with Joan. Conversations with Joan will inspire, motivate, and empower you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. And now, here's your host, Joan Herman. Welcome to Conversations with Joan. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. Conversations with Joan focuses on topics that are important to your life, from health and wellness to professional development to personal well-being. Thought leaders and experts join me to share their insights, tips, and strategies so you can thrive and live your best life now. Thank you for taking time for yourself, and thank you for letting us be a part of your life. Now, let's start talking. The idea that thoughts become things has become popular in today's culture, but what does the scientific evidence tell us about the scope of the human mind to transform thoughts into reality? Today's guest, Dr. Dawson Church, author of Mind to Matter, is here to talk about how our minds create material form. Dr. Church is an award-winning author whose best-selling book, The Genie in Your Genes, has been hailed as a breakthrough in our understanding of the link between emotion and genetics. He founded the National Institute for Integrative Healthcare, and his research has been published in scientific journals. Welcome, Dr. Church. Thank you for joining us. Joan, so good to be here. Thank you. So, Doctor, I want to lead off with something that I believe to be very important, and you're best known for your research into epigenetics. Tell us what epigenetics is and why this is so important. Epigenetics is producing changes in gene expression by means outside the cell. And so we have 24,000 genes, and those genes can be turned on and be turned off. And so all of us has a unique constellation of switches in our genes. Some of those are turned on, some of those are turned off, some of those are dialed partially up or partially down. And so epigenetics is a study of the influences that affect whether those genes are turned on and turned off, both from inside the body and outside the cell. And a very, very simple example is you eat something and the genes that code for your digestive juices will start to turn on and you'll start to produce them. Or it'll, be, it'll get dark, it'll be late at night, and your clock genes will, will turn on and you'll, you'll, you'll feel sleepy. If you get stressed, if you feel emotional, if you feel upset or angry, then your, your stress genes like cortisol and adrenaline uh, producing genes turn on. So all of these, these, these things are affected epigenetically by both our objective circumstances like light and dark and food, but also by subjective ones like how we feel as well. All of those are epigenetic influences on ourselves. And it's so exciting because for years we thought, and actually a lot of people still believe that we are destined or we're predestined. So if we have a family member who had cancer or heart disease or or any condition, sometimes we just say, well, this is my future and we write it off. But this field of study is really showing us just how powerful we are by making different types of lifestyle choices. You know, Joan, I was so struck last year. A friend of mine phoned me in a panic in uh, March of last year and she said I'd been diagnosed with metastasized breast cancer. There was a large tumor in her right breast, and there was also all the lymph nodes under her right armpit were swollen and inflamed and full of cancerous cells, and there were also three spots of inflammation on her right lung. And so it looked like a very serious diagnosis. And my friend actually was also panicked because they did a gene test, and she emailed me and said, I, they, they, my gene test shows I have eight defective genes that predispose me to breast cancer. And what I said to her was, Beth, don't worry, you have 24,000 genes <laughs> that are mm-hmm. perfectly okay. Let's start with those. And she elected not to have radiation, not to have surgery. She did energy work on herself. She cleaned up her diet. She got rid of all the sources of stress in her life. She turned off her alerts. She quit watching the news. She began to do intensive qigong. We did some distant energy healing for her using acupressure and other forms of energy medicine. Two months later, she went back into the hospital, and all of her lymph nodes were clear. And later scans showed that the tumor in her her breast, first of all, shrunk to about a third of the size and then disappeared completely. So all of those signs reversed. Eventually, all of her blood work showed she was cancer-free. And so I'm so impressed by the stories of people like Beth 
who use energy and use, use consciousness and use all of these ways of addressing their health challenges. And so for some people, the radiation might be the perfect thing or the chemotherapy might be their, way, their path to healing. For others, it could be energy. And I really urge people in Mind to Matter to look at the impact that energy has on your relationships, on your money, on your career, on your health, on your sense of well-being. It can have a powerful effect on the material circumstances of your life. So, Dr. Church, you're saying to use energy for someone that doesn't really understand what you mean by that. Can you explain that a little bit further? Sure, Joan. There's a whole field called energy medicine and another one called energy psychology. And energy medicine uses these intangible tools of energy healing to work on physical diseases. Energy medicine is, is powerful and there's research showing there are over a thousand studies showing that energy medicine is effective for all kinds of conditions. And then energy psychology uses energy techniques, mostly acupressure. So it's pressure on acupuncture points. And it uses this to affect psychological problems like anxiety and depression, everything to do with stress. In, in our nonprofit called the Veteran Stress Project, we now treated over 20,000 veterans over the course of the last 10 years. And those are people who come in to see us. They have high levels of PTSD. They're having flashbacks. They're having nightmares. They're having intrusive thoughts. They're hypervigilant. And after just six one-hour energy psychology sessions, those symptoms tend to go away. And in nine out of 10 cases, they never return. So it's powerful to use energy to address whether it's a psychological problem you have, like PTSD or depression, or a medical problem you have, it's really worth looking at the role that energy healing can play and you're getting well again. So this radio show falls under my work, which is under the umbrella of change your attitude, change your life. So I believe in the power of thoughts on our physical and emotional well-being. Can you explain to our listeners exactly how thoughts affect our physical bodies? I was teaching a live workshop at the New York Open Center last year, and we had people hooked up to heart rate variability monitors, which monitor their heart coherence, and also to EEGs that monitor their brain waves. And so I would get people in a nice, relaxed state, and the whole audience could see up on the screen how, when they were relaxed, all of these indicators of stress were, were, looked good. They were all green. Then I had that person think one negative thought, and all the indicators turned red. Their heart rate variability went way down, their stress brain waves went way up, their relaxation brain waves went away, their cell healing and repair brain waves went away. And these are the brain waves that, that are associated with, with stem cell growth, that are associated with telomeres, our, our main uh, marker of aging. All of these stress hormone and cell markers went way down when people thought just one negative thought. So it's powerful when you hook people up to these machines and you can actually read what's going on inside their bodies. You can read the level, levels of cortisol, the levels of stress brain waves. And you think just one negative thought, and in Mind to Matter, I have lots of graphs and images of what it looks like on a heart rate monitor or on an EEG or on an MRI. And you see all of those positive markers will go away and all these negative markers of stress will kick in like high cortisol, high adrenaline, high beta brain waves, all of these things kick in just by negative thinking. So you have a powerful effect on your, your body. And, and mind to matter, in the book I review over 400 studies. One of them shows, for example, that people who are optimistic, who just have positive stories about their lives, they don't, they don't have perfect lives, but they just have an optimistic way of looking at life. They have a lifespan that's eight years longer than pessimists. That's the long-term effect of mm -hmm. thinking positively, of reducing your stress, reducing your cortisol, and bringing your body into balance just with your thoughts. So our thoughts are not intangible, immaterial uh, fluff. They are having a direct effect at the level of our cells, of our genes, on our body. Well, because we're, we're spending so much time in that fight or flight response mode, we're so stressed out, we're, we're walking around angry. And, and when we do, like you say, we, we produce the cortisol and the adrenaline that surges through our body, and it creates disease. And then we wonder why we're getting sick. Mm, yes. And, and the effect is instantaneous. Now, there, there are two pieces to it. One is short-term, one is long-term. So your body is meant to be able, be able to handle an adrenaline surge or a cortisol surge if something bad is happening. So if, for example, you're um, walking into a sketchy neighborhood and it looks dangerous, then you will have a rise in adrenaline and cortisol because you have to be, that's an appropriate fight or flight response. But the trouble is most of us are thinking ourselves into high 
stress without anything bad happening in our lives. So our, our lives are just, just great. We're just sitting in, our, in the armchair relaxing, but our thoughts are then running riot. And there's a part of the brain called the default mode network, which is the part of the brain that's active when we're doing, not doing a task. So if I'm not actively focused on a task, the default mode network kicks in. And what it tends to think about and focus on is the bad stuff. We think about the, the problem we have at work. We think about the, the, what our, our teenager said to us or our parents said to us or some, some teammate wrote us an email that really upset us. So we, the default mode network, when we're not focused on a task, the brain just kicks, just kicks over with all of these negative thoughts and those drive our cortisol up epigenetically all the time, even when there's nothing bad to have to deal with. So that's the problem is we can think ourselves into disease even when our lives are, are pretty secure and, and okay. So Dr. Church, what techniques do you recommend to calm the brain? One is meditation. So meditation is number one. Number two is called emotional freedom techniques or EFT, acupressure, or, or what's called tapping sometimes because you tap with your fingertips on these acupuncture points. And that calms people really quickly. That's, that's what we've used with those 20,000 veterans as EFT. So those two things. And we're getting literally thousands of responses where people are saying, I'm trying the, these, these methods in the book. They are so easy. One of them, for example, is grounding. Just walking out into nature and grounding yourself by taking off your shoes and standing in wet grass. The Earth, Earth has a huge number of electrons. And those those electrons flood up your body and they neutralize free radicals, the main cause of, cause of aging. And so just a simple practice like grounding can make you feel much better. And so I have 30 of these practices, but the two I recommend at minimum are meditation and also EFT because meditation makes you feel good in the morning and then EFT gives you a way to return to that, that good feeling baseline throughout the day. Dr. Church, do you think that mainstream medicine is catching up with what we're talking about? Definitely. I, I give... In, in my live workshops, I have every year we have hundreds of psychotherapists, psychologists, doctors, nurses. Uh, many of them are learning these energy techniques and having great, great results from them. They're, they're, they're also, last year, EFT was accepted by the VA as an evidence-based technique which, which VA employees can use. It took us 10 years to get that, that certification. So uh, medicine changes slowly, but it is working its way into modern medicine. Just for example, at MD Anderson Cancer Clinic, they have several branches throughout, throughout the U.S. And at the Orlando, Florida branch, they have a practitioner who does energy medicine with cancer patients. So it is uh, increasingly being used. And, and about, studies show that about 40% of people uh, act, actively use some kind of alternative medicine practice. So it's growing. We estimate about 20 million people worldwide use EFT. And so the numbers are, are growing as people look for alternatives to, I mean, who, who wants to be on a drug for the rest of your life? The average, the average senior in Britain is on five different medications. The average Canadian senior is on five different medications. I mean, we're medicating ourselves in, in these ways, and often these medications have, have unpleasant side effects. So you, you may need them, but what I urge people to do is you might need that material medical intervention, but also look at what thought can do, what can consciousness do, what, 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 is your, what effect is your belief having on your body? In one huge study by the University of Rochester, they found that people who believed that they were at low risk for cardiac events, heart attacks, strokes, and so on. Those, those who believed they were at low risk for those things were at a much lower risk for them, irrespective of their age and uh, medical history and risky behaviors. So just the belief that something is true has an effect. So I urge people to not neglect their, the medical side of the equation, but look at what they can do in terms of attitude, belief, history, all of those things in your consciousness are having a direct effect on your body. And if you just look at the material side of medicine and look at the material medical approaches, you're missing a huge piece of the puzzle. So up until this point, we've been talking about the power of our thoughts on our personal body. But how do our thoughts affect the material world outside of our bodies? Joan, this is so interesting. In Mind to Matter, I talk all about how energy can change the world outside of your body. And one of the examples I use, several of the studies I, I discuss are to do with water. And uh, research shows, for example, that if you take t water divided into two groups of, say, bottles of water at random, and then have one of those bottles blessed 
by an energy medicine practitioner like a healing touch practitioner or a Reiki practitioner. So now one of those sets of bottles is blessed by the practitioner. And then you go water seeds with them. In the group of seeds that's watered with the blessed water, the intention-filled water that's affected by that, that healing practitioner, more of those seeds will germinate. Also, those plants will usually grow taller and bigger and stronger and have more chlorophyll in them than the ones that are not blessed. So our intentions, our energy is having an effect on water. And in a really interesting series of experiments, I talk about the, the way the structure of water. It's, it's H2O. It has one oxygen atom, two hydrogens are bonded to it. And what the researchers found was that if water was blessed by a healer in that way, that the angle of the bond between the oxygen and the two hydrogens actually changed. So the water was actually physically changed by that act of blessing. So we're, we're definitely having an effect on molecules in our environment, like being able to put your hands over water or pray over your food, for example. It's made me much, much more inclined now to hold, sit there for a moment and really hold high intention around my food than I did before. So there are quite a number of experiments showing that we affect molecules outside of our bodies as well. And it's worth knowing how you're doing that. There, there's research showing that, for example, we can affect electromagnetism, one of the four fundamental forces of physics. There are Qigong masters who can affect nuclear forces, the atom rate of atomic decay. And it's really exciting to see that we don't just affect the molecules inside our bodies. We're literally affecting the molecules outside of our bodies. And then it also covers, in the book, I also talk about things like distant healing, all the remarkable evidence for these phenomena like, for example, the ability to hold an intention of somebody who's a long way away. So there are distant effects that sometimes extend for thousands of miles away from the intender. And so these non-local effects of our ability to, to have an effect on the outside world are, are really amazing. And I think that that's where research will go in the future. We'll start to, to map out how we can affect the, the pulse rate or the heart rate variability or the cortisol level of somebody who's 10,000 miles away. How is it even possible to do this? And the, the book talks about the power of synchronicity and how that we live in a synchronous universe. And when we align our consciousness, our little local human mind, with non-local consciousness, with the, the force that of, of the universe, huge universal forces, if you can meditate and align yourself with those giant forces, suddenly you invite synchronicity into your life, and synchronicity becomes, I tell a lot of stories of synchronicity in, in the book, people about synchronous experiences, and, and they're just amazing how they're able to then influence the, the, the course of, of events with their intentions. So yes, we can have this, this, this pr profound effect on the world outside of ourselves with our consciousness as well. And is that what you mean when you say to get into the flow? Yes, and that flow state is so interesting because it turns out that we all experience flow sometimes, but you can train yourself to experience flow most of the time. The book is Mind to Matter. If you would like to get more information about Dr. Church and his work, you can visit mindtomatter.club. Dr. Church, thank you so much for spending time with us. This is such a fascinating topic, and, and I'm so happy that you were here to share all of this with us because I know many people tend to feel that they're powerless when they're going through something, and, and I want everyone to understand just how powerful we really are. So thank you for sharing all of this information with us. It's a pleasure, Joan, and you're right. We are far more powerful than we believed. This is Conversations with Joan. Stay with us. We'll be right back. 